All right. Uh, hello, welcome to the first episode of Emacs.l. This is your host, uh, Daniel Gopar. And for our first guest, we have uh, Sasha Chua. Uh, Sasha, do you want to introduce yourself uh, briefly? Oh, hi, I'm Sasha Chua. I'm based in Toronto, and I've, you know, I, I love using Emacs for all sorts of things, which I'm sure we'll get into in this first podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, no problem. So first off, for anybody listening, I have to say that uh, if you hear background noises, I apologize for that. Um, there's something going on in my town, so it's really noisy right now. So I should have planned that ahead. Even though That's there okay. Giant billboards all over the city announcing this. That I completely <laughs> forgot about. I think of it this way. If we could deal with Emacs Conf having sirens in the background, a couple of airplanes, no problem. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> All right, so basically, uh, just the first question: uh, How did you get into Emacs? You know, the question that everybody is asked once. So yeah. Well, I was in university and trying to read as much as I could of the computer science books in the libraries, and I came across Unix Power Tools. This book had a chapter on Emacs, among lots of other tools, of course. And I think the chapter mentioned weird things like MetaX Doctor and MetaX Tetris, and I was like, what? This is a text editor. And so I started using it for programming and other interesting things. Um, but then I also got into outline mode and planner mode. And once I got into planner mode and that wonderful, wonderful community of, of people who use Emacs for, or running their lives, um, I got really hooked. It also helped that at some point in so at some point in university, my laptop screen stopped working. You didn't have to like tilt it so you actually didn't see anything, bad contrast and whatever. But it turns out that of course Emacs has Emacs Speak, which can work with a text to speech synthesizer like Festival Light, also for free, so that you could actually get Emacs to talk to you. Uh, so whenever I couldn't read my screen, I got Emacs to tell me, you know, what was going on, uh, reading manuals and, and even uh, responding to email when I was, you know, just when I couldn't see that screen. Cool stuff. Well, that's interesting. I've, uh, I've heard of Emacs Speaks, but I never really tried it out. So I, I, I want to see how it works. I'll, I'll try it out eventually. <laughs> it's really cool. Like Emacs has all these strange and wonderful things that you can combine. Uh, speaking of Emacs speak, by the way, so you know how there's ERC, which is one of the IRC clients or chat clients within Emacs. And Emacs speak lets you get stuff from Emacs and convert them into speech. Um, one of the things that I did before when I was, of course, supposed to be focusing on something else was to get ERC to use Emacs speak to say things to me whenever someone mentioned me in the Emacs channel on, on Freenode. So I could just you know do my thing in the background, but if, if somebody wanted my attention, my computer would actually talk to me. And you can do that stuff with Emacs. Yeah, wow, I did not think that that is, wow, that sounds, that sounds pretty awesome. Did it take a while to do or not really? Or... No, because basically there's just one command uh, that you can use it, you know, that you need to use with Emacs speak in order to get it to say things. And then there's a hook in ERC um, so that you can tell it anytime somebody mentions you, make this special piece of code happen. So yeah, you can, if you dig into the internals, not even very deeply into the internals, those are like variables you can customize, you can make this stuff work. Oh, wow, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know, right? Weird. <laughs> so all right. so uh, the next question, what do you mostly use uh, Emacs for? Well, of course, there's programming, but I'm really curious about using Emacs for all sorts of other things. Uh, so for example, I have this little bit of org mode that um, that lets me use Emacs for meal planning. So I can, you know, have a list of recipes and I can say, okay, you know, remind me about this in a month or like two months. And this one is beef or, or pork or chicken. And it makes this table that shows me, okay, you know, like for the next week or so, this is what you've got planned. I don't use it all the time, but when I do use it so that I can remember all these things I haven't been cooking lately, it's actually really fun that you can do this. <laughs> All right, sweet. Uh, I have a question. Do you also use uh, Emacs to edit uh, uh, Google Docs files, or you haven't gone or haven't tried that out? Because I, I, I tried doing that, but uh, I, I seem like a lot of trouble to go through it. 
You know, I, I haven't really looked into it, mostly because if I'm just writing things for myself, then I'll use org mode in the text file, right? Um, if I want to save things so that they're somewhere in the web, then I will do that org mode or, or, or whatever in a Dropbox or with Git. And it's only when I want somebody else to be able to edit things at the same time that I'll turn to Google Docs. Um, but in general, if I'm sharing things with people, like if I'm sharing things with people who are also Emacs and we might use Git instead. But I guess it's just for the real-time thing. And I think there are some alternatives to Google Docs for real-time editing. It just doesn't really come up with for me very often. Hmm. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw a package recently on, uh, I think it was Mopa, that you can mm -hmm. do uh, something like this, kind of like pair programming. Yeah, in real -time yeah. With Emacs. So I thought that was interesting. I didn't really look into it. but. Uh, yeah, that's why I was curious if uh, if anybody has been able to do kind of like real time uh, applications with uh, Emacs, you know, typing, pair programming, that kind of stuff. I think that's yeah. stuff. Yeah, there are lots of uh, there are lots of ways that people ex have explored. So at the Emacs conference, someone was demonstrating how to use Teammate and Tmux, uh, which of course devolved into chaos when he shared the you know the uh, interactive SSH uh, information with everyone. Um, but yeah, it's it's great to see lots of different people trying out uh, different approaches that actually work quite well. All right, yeah. All right, so uh, I'm going to say something. When I started using Emacs, um, I thought it was awesome, kind of like basically everybody does. So uh, when I learned Emacs, I went straight to my friends and I told them, hey, you know, there's this thing called Emacs. It is mind blowing. It's the best thing that has ever been created. So I basically started preaching it to everybody. Did you uh, kind of started preaching the word of Emacs to anybody, or not really? Actually, no. I mean, I, I started using Emacs when I was in, uh, taking up my computer science degree, and of course, by looking, I think by then, still people were very much attached to Eclipse or or whatever, or they were, you know, getting by somehow. I don't know with Pico, or they were firmly into Vim or or whatever. I I, I tend to. I love sharing my enthusiasm about Emacs, but it's really more along lines of, hey, did you know that you could do this cool thing um, and writing about that in my blog so that it's it's less about telling people, oh, you should use Emacs. It's so awesome. It'll change your life, although it, it will. Um, and more like, you know, if you're interested, here's some cool stuff that you can do with it. I'm not going to push you to, to get into it. But hey, you know, if you're curious, so you can ask. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. I kind of presented, well, well kind of, I did present at EmacsConf, so <laughs> there's no kind in there, I did. <laughs> so basically, um, what I did was I presented about the challenges of using Emacs, right? And mm -hmm. before I get into that, I just want to say something that that's right, you know, uh, instead of just saying that it's awesome, you got to kind of show it. And I've done some YouTube videos that's not uh, related to Emacs, but it's programming, and I was using Emacs in those videos, so they saw me jumping around and stuff like that. And people would actually email me and ask me, hey, what are you using? That looks so awesome. And yeah. I said, okay, sweet. Uh, another way to reach out to more people for using Emacs. Yeah, I think that's, that's a real ticket, right? I mean, even if you use a tool in a fairly basic way, if you're comfortable with it, then then people respond to that. You know, they're, they're curious about things that like, why do you have a tool that makes you so happy? Or, or how on earth did you get your editor to do this, this little thing that saves you all that time? And that becomes the reason to get through the, the scary part of the learning curve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right. So now, uh, since my rant was also about uh, my Emacs rant at the conference, was also about the kind of like the barrier for entry beginners. Did you have any specific problems when starting to use Emacs or or not really? Well, I don't think, uh, I didn't really have a lot of people around here also using Emacs. And, and so it was really just the internet and books um, and, uh, and figure things out. But I think I think the main challenge for me with with Emacs learning is really the limitations of my own imagination. Like, you know, just just realizing that something is possible because you're watching someone's video or reading someone's config, and you're like, "What on earth is that?" Um, 
because if I can't imagine it, then I'm not going to go and find out exactly how to do it. But uh, but once I see it or once I say, you know, this thing over here that I'm doing again and again, there must be a better way to do that. Then it becomes really easy to go and find something and maybe like, you know, clutch it a little so that it fits into my config and fits the way that I work. But that that I think is the biggest challenge for me at this point, just imagining what else I want to do with it, with Emacs and how I want to do it. All right. Sweet. <laughs> now, um, so if someone was uh, like a beginner watching this or uh, or later on as a reference, they just happened to land on this uh, podcast uh, listening or watching the video, would you have them any tips or recommendations for starting mm -hmm. out? Oh, well, this this is a tip that I, I find very useful myself still, um, mm -hmm. because we're always beginners, right? There's always something more to learn and, and explore. It's so easy to to get overwhelmed by all the different things that you need to learn or that you can configure or that you can you can customize. And I often have to remind myself to slow down and not be frustrated because I can't just learn everything out, like immediately or get things set up exactly the way I want right away. I can't, you know, I can't even tell you how slowly I'm learning things like Calc or Smart Parents. I'm really just learning it one little bit at a time. But that learning things one little bit at a time and giving yourself time to to become comfortable with it, and maybe just focusing that next little step that you can you can really try out and and see if you can fit it into your workflow and and whatever that I think makes it a lot more manageable. So don't get intimidated by the fact that people are doing all sorts of crazy things with it. Just focus on, you know, start off using it as a basic text editor. It's totally all right to use the toolbar and the, you know, the menus and all that stuff. And then just gradually learn other things as you can, as you have the time and as it pays off for you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's really uh, good. I mean, uh, yeah, you're right. We're all beginners. I mean, uh, everybody's learning something new no matter how much experience you have. And uh, yeah, I mean, I remember starting out with, uh, you know, what four lines in my uh, innate configuration, you know, I was like, wow, this is pretty small. I see somebody else's, they have, you know, folders and file structures and the hierarchy all figured out. It's wow. So, yeah, it slowly, slowly starts growing as the more you learn. So yeah. Um, so what made you create resources uh, at, like your site, uh, sashachua.com? So, did you just started it for for fun or for a special reason or just? Well, it's I I I basically started it because I can't really remember things. Um, I mean, you know, this is a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, but I can't tell you how many times I've Googled for something, uh, only to end up back on my own blog after six months. You know, writing this post and then I did step by step instructions on how to do this like small technical thing, and it's. It's like, yes, yes, I, you know, I'm glad I wrote those notes. So it's helpful that, that Emacs makes it so easy to take notes along the way, of course. And since I'm, if I kept it just on my computer, then I might lose it or I might not, not be able to find it again. But if I put it out there, at least I can use a search engine. Um, and it's really nice when other people drop by and say, yeah, actually, this saved me a couple of minutes too. Great, fantastic. And it's even better when I, you know, I write about something that I've spent two hours or so figuring out. And I'm very proud of my very, very clever solution. And then someone's like, didn't you know about this uh, five minute solution? It's like, you know, it's built in, it's, you know, this variable that you change or whatever. And, and, and I'm like, why didn't you tell me about this earlier? But of course, they wouldn't be able to, right? Um, so at least it's out there. And I know a better way. And other people looking for it know a better way, too. So I definitely recommend blogging. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. I started blogging as well just to put random bits. And sometimes I have to, that are specific bits uh, that people might also need. So sometimes I have to go back to myself, so one of those blogs. I'm pretty sure a lot of people do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and yeah, or whenever someone asks you, oh, how do you do that command completion that you have? And they're like, ha ha, I have a link. You know, <laughs> you can just go check this out where I've written down this explanation of things I've understood. And it does save a lot of time and it, it keeps the conversation growing. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. All right. So, yeah, all right, to remember things. Okay. <laughs> all right. And so, you can understand things as well. You find that when you start trying to explain things and you don't have to be an expert or experienced or anything to, to even just start explaining things even if you're just saying you know i'm really confused by this but i think this is what's going on and here's some links and here's the output or you know i'm trying to figure this out and these are the things that i'm considering 
even the process of writing about those things is very, very helpful. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know that uh, for not, you just don't only have your uh, your site, but you also do uh, Emacs chats, which is kind of like a Google Hangouts as well. Mm. Um, so what made you uh, start that? Okay. So, uh, so you know, I, I, you know how people are sharing their Emacs configurations on the web, which is fantastic. You know, I love reading through people's configs and and coming across packages that I wouldn't have otherwise heard about, and you know, seeing what kinds of keyboard shortcuts they've set up and the variables and whatever. But sometimes just reading a config doesn't give you a sense of how it all fits together. Like, how do they use it? Um, you know, why did they choose this customization or this variable setting or whatever? Uh, it's a little intimidating to kind of sit down and record a screencast sometimes or do a presentation or even write a blog post. A lot of people are like, well, that's a lot of work. But um, but if you're just casually chatting with somebody else, you know, showing them what you do and how you do it, it's it's a lot friendlier and, and they can ask questions and they can point out that cool thing that you take for granted that you you know you've been doing it for years and and other people are like, why does your mode line look like that? Or what's that cartoon cat doing in your status bar or whatever? Um, so it's, I find that, that having a kind of conversation makes it easier to get stuff out of people's heads, you know, just get them to, to show their workflow and, and, and do that in a way that, uh, that's, that's on video and other people can learn from, even if they're not part of that original conversation. So that's where Emacs chats came out of, you know, just talking to people about their Emacs configuration or about the packages they use and, and just how they use Emacs. And of course, getting a sense also of who they are, you know, what else they're interested in, what they're like as, as part of the community. No, yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's true because when someone codes or does a piece of code, um, you don't know what they're thinking. Everybody thinks differently, so their mindset might you might you might learn something new on the way that they did it. So asking them uh, in, uh, person to person, uh, that that's a great way to learn. So yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, what's the status of Emacs chats? Are you gonna continue to make them, or because I know you released one like two weeks ago or a week ago? I'm not Good. sure. Um, oh, that was a that was a follow up with Mas Masa after his uh, cool demo of graphics in Emacs. So we we walked through a little bit of the code uh, afterwards. So he had more time to uh, to to demonstrate things and explain. I have been scheduling a lot of Emacs chats lately because I always get anxious. You know, it's like what if I you know what if I'm I'm too fuzzy brained to ask interesting questions or uh, like how do I you know how do I set this up and and whatever, um, Emacs Hangouts, which are more informal and less of this, you know, two people thing, maybe they're sometimes they're eight people, 10 people, whoever shows up, right? They're a little bit easier to schedule because it's basically set the time and, and show up and whoever else shows up can chat about whatever they're interested in talking about. But even then, sometimes I think, oh no, what if nobody shows up or what if it gets really awkward? Um, so ideally, if somebody else wanted to set up these things and just schedule them and make them happen, I can just show up and, and chat with other people about Emacs. That'd be great. But in the meantime, you know, it'll it'll happen when it happens. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sweet. <laughs> do you get requests uh, to make them with a certain person, or not really? Or... I do, like with the Emacs chats, especially since that's more of a deep dive into someone's particular way of using Emacs, and you know, people have, have suggested all sorts of fascinating people, like the the Space Emacs guy, right? You know, it'd be great to uh, to dig into how people actually use these things. Um, and I am totally for people, other people also kind of setting up these. Uh, so I'm hoping your podcast series, you know, takes off and, and digs into these, these uh, fascinating topics. Um, but yeah, because we, we really could use a lot of these workflow type conversations. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's one of the reasons uh, I created this podcast as well. I guess you can call it a selfish region. Uh, oh, selfish totally. Region. Absolutely. Best way to learn. Good yeah, excuse yeah. to go like ask people that you really look up to or that you're curious about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, just learn about their configuration and stuff like yeah. that. And yeah. it's nice because it's a, like because it's recorded and it's shared and you know and you can put it in a blog post or you can extract tips from it, whatever. It, it really, it multiplies the time. So, you know, they spend... 30 minutes and are talking to you and you can get 
feedback back for like months afterwards saying, you know, I was listening to this and I t- I came across this useful package and it was so helpful. So it's, it's great to get that kind of knowledge out there. Yeah. yeah. So one of the things uh, uh, that I guess at the conference, the, the UMAX conference was, uh, I guess you can say I was just ranting the whole time, <laughs> but uh, uh, because when I started learning, um, the, uh, I was on IRC as well on the Emacs channel, and uh, sometimes I would get, uh, you know, not the most uh, helpful answer, kind of vague. So I wasn't really, uh, you know, I, w- I didn't felt like uh, welcome. You know, like they kind of expected me to know all of this already. Maybe that, you know, just some of the people that were already there that I happened to uh, ask the question to or something. But uh, what do you think of the current uh, Emacs community as of now? Uh- I'm sorry you had that experience. Um, so there's there's a thing called the curse of knowledge or the curse of expertise, right? Where once you've learned something, you forget how much of, of a struggle it was to learn that. And so people sometimes who are quick to say, read the effing manual, forget that actually the manual is a little hard to read, or especially if you, you don't know what the terms mean or how it all fits together or where to even start looking. Uh, but in general, like I, f- I find the Emacs community to be pretty friendly. It's a little difficult sometimes because there's so many different ways to use and configure Emacs. Uh, even with the starter kits, you know, there's the get, you know, even like, for example, with evil mode, I have very little experience with it. I would love to help people more when they have questions, but I just have no idea what's going on. So uh, this, I can help a little bit by searching, but mm. it's hard. And you multiply that by all the different possibilities in the Emacs channel or Emacs Stack Exchange. And if you're lucky, you'll find someone who's recently struggled with the same issues you have. Um, and, and then you can connect and you can get your answers sorted out quickly. But um, but often it's like, well, can I? Maybe I can point you to some resources that might be helpful, but you'll still have to do a fair bit of figuring things out yourself, and that is a bit of a challenge for people who are new. Yeah, yeah. I find you know when I was reading the manual and stuff and online as well, I kind of didn't understand some of the terms. For example, uh, font locking. I did not know that meant syntax highlighting. I thought it was something else. That, that caught me a yeah. surprise. A trick I picked up um, a long time ago was to, uh, especially with books that have a lot of terms you don't understand or, or manuals or li- like that as well, is to read the entire thing several times. Um, mm-hmm. And I find actually that every time I read the Emacs manual or the org manual, I learn something new. Like I think that the most recent time I reread the Emacs manual, I learned about Control X8, which lets you like, like for example, Control X8 enter, I think lets you input Unicode characters by name. And so I spent the next like 30 minutes inserting snowman, you know, into my my text. Um, but it, when you start, you know, reading things without stressing out about comprehension so much, not worrying so much about weird terms, you might find that a bit later on, you read the same term in a different context and it makes it easier for you to understand. Or you read someone's blog post and you're like, oh, okay, this makes sense now a little bit more. Uh, so it's, it's like, it's, yeah, not giving up and, and keeping on reading and, and slowly getting a sense of what everything means. Yeah, actually, uh, one of the things that actually helped me stay on uh, learning Emacs was I saw one of your Hangouts. And I'm pretty sure the reason why I kept sticking with Emacs was because I kept showing uh, the, the, you know, the monthly uh, Emacs Hangouts. And I'm pretty sure if I hadn't found of that, I would have probably just uh, dropped the uh, Emacs. I said, ah, I, don't, I don't really see any good people around here. Until <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your Hangouts, actually. I think it's one of the reasons why, main reasons why I stick with Emacs so far. I'm, so. I'm very happy that that helped you. I and mean, one of the things that makes Emacs so much fun for me is, is that sense of the people and the community in it. Like, I've... I, I look at the package list or, or people's configs and I, I get a sense that every one of those lines is somebody who has said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if Emacs could do this? Or, or you know, they're like, oh, you know, I'm getting really frustrated about this. Let me just fix it for myself and, and maybe share that with other people. And this, this the sense of, of other people in this community, of, of people who, who are figuring things out and are enthusiastic about stuff, that I think is is something I hope lots of other people experience and get to know. Okay, yeah. well, at least you know that you know I'm I'm one of the people affected by the work that you've done. 
Well, I, because of this podcast recording, I finally got around to scheduling the one for October. So there's one in October 14, um, and I've put the link into into the the show notes so we can add that eventually when get when we post it. But yeah, you know, if we can get if we can get a monthly Emacs hangout going, or maybe even more often, where it's totally like you know, maybe there's someone with a prepared talk or whatever maybe it's just people chatting because who can be bothered to prepare but it's really it's like a virtual emacs meetup for the people of you know for for those among us who are not as not lucky enough to live in london or or new york or all those places with with actually large emacs meetups so wow that's so awesome <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so another question about the emacs hangout did you try to do that uh, as well just to uh bring kind of like the community closer like i was saying uh, because because of those i actually felt like i was part of something so th is that like another reason why you created them or well i i think you learn so much about emacs by looking over someone's shoulder right by by just watching someone do something that like you have no idea was was possible or hearing about cool stuff as, as people show you know uh, show off mm -hmm. their configs or, or or even their questions I it's one of the reasons why I enjoy hanging out in the Emacs channel on Freenode whenever I remember to actually start up uh, uh, the the Emacs really chat the client but also you know having it in video having it with screen sharing that's a lot of fun. So the, the Emacs Hangout was really just me being too lazy to start an in well, too lazy and too introverted to start an in-person hangout um, in, in Toronto. There are a couple of other Emacs things apparently, but it requires organizational skills to get people together. Mm -hmm. But online, it's it's easy to reach out, and then you can you can connect with anyone, even if they're in a different place or actually very different time zones. We've had people like stay up in the middle of the night to go to one of these things, and it's incredible. Yeah. But of course, people are, you know, if you want to organize one that's a time zone better suited to you, totally go for it. Okay. All right. Sweet. <laughs> Thanks for the answer. Um, so when you started the Emacs ha chats or uh, any other, uh, the other Google Hangouts, did you have any uh, like problems or people kind of saying, you know, that's not a good idea or any type of, you know, like negative feedback or anything around that? Oh, the Emacs community has actually been really awesome. I, I have very low expectations for these things. So basically, it's okay. Let's show up and talk about random things related to Emacs, um, and and people bring fascinating, fascinating tips and and cool packages and little demonstrations and questions. So that's great. Um, I think actually most of the the negative stuff is mostly me worrying that nobody will show up or that it'll be awkward. You know. Big silences and oh, did I, you know, oh, what, what will I do? I, I don't have anything interesting, Emacs related to report myself. Um, but other people, like, whenever I like just step back and let people chat, um, it works out. Uh, so that I just have to, to get over my holy cow, what if I'm too fuzzy brained and you know, on the date and you know, just if I scheduled in advance. Um, and people come, then they come, and we have a great conversation. Um, I guess the other thing is, in terms of technology, I've been using Google Hangouts on air because it's easy to you know, get people together, get it streamed for the people who just want to watch, get it you know recorded for the people who want to watch afterwards. And then, of course, once it's on YouTube, people can do whatever they want to the video as well, including listening to it or downloading it or or watching it, uh, like putting it in blog posts. But um, but because it's Google, people are some people are like, well, I don't know about this. I don't want to have a Google account or or use Google products. I'm very glad that the Emacs conference folks, you know, explored a lot of these uh, other web conferencing alternatives. So, it, you know, Jitsi might be one, or but I haven't found anything that quite covers that combination of of web conferencing and streaming and broadcasting. But it's something that other people who want to host Emacs, conf um, Emacs Hangouts can certainly go and figure out. Hmm, OK. So going just a little bit back about the, about you overthinking stuff for, uh, for you know, your Hangouts, uh, yeah, I get that feeling. I'm having I know. <laughs> which huh? which yeah. is actually one of the reasons why I like Emacs chats are you know more focused and more one-on-one, -on -one, et cetera, et cetera. But the Emacs Hangout, because there are more people, it's, it's like the, I, I actually like group conversations more than one-on-one -on -one conversations because if I need to like kind of take a small break and just relax and listen for a bit, other people can keep on chatting and they'll come up with interesting questions I would never have thought of. So yeah. that works out really well for me. 
<laughs> yeah, I totally understand. Yeah, I was wondering as well if my questions would be, you know, uh, top tier material or, or something like that. But uh, what we'll, was we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and, and which is also, you know, since you're planning to have a co-host for for future episodes, that's another great tactic too, because yeah. then. Um, somebody else can be listening for for that opportunity for an interesting follow-up question or whatever i find sometimes um when i'm the one trying you know trying to host and an interview or whatever it, it gets a little buzzy in my head it's it's hard to pay it you know just you, you, you start worrying about things um mm -hmm. but yeah, it turns out that actually emacs seeks are very nice and non-intimidating and will help you out um and um and yeah, and especially if you get several of them together, then it becomes a, an even better conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, going back to the Emacs community, what do you think we can do uh, to improve Emacs as a whole, or to just uh, you know uh, spread more about the Emacs gospel, or you know better the community, stuff like that? Well, I really like how people are are sharing more in terms of blog posts or videos or whatever else. It's you know definitely there's there's all sorts of things we can do from helping absolute beginners by you know creating tutorials and and creating safe spaces for them to go and figure things out. Um, there's you know there's also helping beginners become intermediate users. You know how do you go beyond just using it as a simple text editor and start playing with it, start customizing it to fit you. And then there's the, you know, how do you how do you get people really hooked um, in terms of in terms of like getting Emacs to the point where it, you you practically enjoy playing with it. You're you know, you you have fun customizing it and, and getting you to do what you want. I tend to spend most of my time thinking about the the latter part, you know, just the that well, you know, let's see what crazy things we can do with Emacs now. Um, but I love the fact that this entire range of, of of people working all along that spectrum, and not just in in terms of like you know programming and computer science and databases and stuff like that, but also people looking at things like org um, and reproducible research and statistics and, uh, and you know and all sorts of like, other applications of Emacs. Yeah. So what I've noticed was that Emacs isn't really advertised in any way. Uh, so, and what I found is that people who are looking for Emacs, they just find it. So, um, basically, I know that the, the, most of the advertising comes from the Emacs users themselves. You know, uh, like I read a, a post about saying that Adam, Adam uh, GitHub's new ed text editor, I think it's called Adam, something like that, is uh, has kind of like a, has a repository, kind of like Emacs, you know, Melpa and Marmalade, all that, and someone was ranting like on a black post that this is the new Emacs because uh, it already surpasses like uh, I think Melpa by packages but I mean cool. when you when you think about it um, get uh, that text editor was heavily advertised by Adam I mean I would get spammed about the news and they would even mention it like when you ever you logged in into github I said okay I get it you guys are launching a new uh, a new uh, text editor but what I feel is that if people actually try to advertise, I think there will be a large, uh, I think it will grow large, the population uh, largely, because I mean, once you try Emacs, it's mind blowing. I mean, wow, why haven't I ever heard of this before? Why has nobody ever shown me stuff like that? So, I mean, that, that's just my opinion of if uh, we actually advertised of, of some kind. <laughs> I get the sense that a lot, of, a lot of times Emacs spreads because somebody see someone doing something cool right or they mm -hmm. they they hear you know you're if you're often talking about oh i you know i did this really nifty thing um and then they start wondering how is it possible that you could do this you know how is it how, like how how can you do that with a text editor with your tools and i, I have a feeling that that that's how emacs sense is spread and it's for me at least it it's a totally all right way to do that it's it's perfectly legitimate we don't really need to take out billboards or things like that mm -hmm. it does spread a bit slowly then i mean it, it seems a little cruel for example for well not cruel but you know but if you had like you know if you said okay everyone must use emacs in your mm -hmm. like lecture class or your uh, your company or whatever it it might kind of 
it runs the risk of killing their intrinsic enjoyment of Emacs. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But if, on the other hand, it's more organic. It's more, uh, you know, like, huh, I am curious about this. I see you're having a lot of fun with it. You're doing really cool stuff, and it helps you. Uh, it might be worth my learning how to do this as well, because I want that feeling of excitement and joy and occasional frustration, but also that feeling of triumph and accomplishment. I think that it makes sense for Emacs to spread that way. Yeah, yeah that, that makes sense. Yeah, I definitely had my, uh, you know, moments of, oh, man, I can't get this to work. And then when I finally get it, I feel awesome, you know, for like <laughs> things. And then I realized how simple the solution was. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I understand. <laughs> Yeah, and so like you know, I I don't expect it to suddenly take over everything. Although with evil mode and you know, every so often there's like this mass migration of of people from one defunct text editor. Like uh, what? A, what there, was, there was this big Ruby migration sometime before um, either defunct text editors or because this you know this tool really takes off. Like the way that Mag Maggot or Magit. Um, is is pulling people into Emacs, uh, so there's there's certainly like mass waves of stuff like that going on, mm -hmm. but even one by one, um, spark by spark, that works too. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned uh, maggot or maggot or however it's pronounced. I, I always get know. confused whenever I yeah. say things. Yeah. So you want to say it's like it's it's like magic, <laughs> but it's also <laughs> Git. Right. So mm -hmm. it does weird yeah. things to your brain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I actually tried it and it's mind blowing. Now, now I know why everybody was ranting about it. It's it's amazing. I I love it. I yeah. can't imagine life without it. It's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. so, so packages like that also help you stick to uh, Emacs. So I know that uh, I think you interviewed someone who mostly used Emacs for org mode, and that's the only reason why they stuck with it. Yeah. And that's totally all right too. Yeah. Uh, uh, personally, I don't like org mode. I'm probably gonna that's have cool. all my viewers just leave right now. So yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, at, at least I haven't uh, found or stuck mm -hmm. enough with org mode for me to actually like it or stuff like that. Uh, and, I don't know. And it's a nice, you know, the nice thing about Emacs is that there are a lot of options out there, and 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 a lot of those options are because people have thought about what they wanted and have carefully sculpted, you know, whatever you know, Emacs list or whatever, and it's something that fits them, maybe fits a couple of other people. And then as more requests come in, they you know, make it fit a few more people and, and on and on. And you get these, these lovely kind of sets of possibilities that may be very, very different from each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely diverse. Yeah. Um, so since we've been talking a lot about the community already, um, have you seen anything from uh, from the Emacs of how difficult it is to change, you know, the like uh, the Emacs culture point of view to uh, something else, or you know how it trans the transition from one point of view to another one, or something along that area? I haven't looked much into, uh, say, for example, what's going on with core development, and you know, the, I I understand they're you know getting a little concerned over making sure you know there's enough people getting into core development and and keeping things going and understanding the complexities of how things work together on that level. Um, I haven't dug into it myself, so I don't know like how difficult it is to get into. Although. For me, it sounds a little intimidating still. Someday I will sit down and 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 try to learn that stuff. Um, but in terms of the external things, like the or the Emacs lists, the extensions, the um, the, the packages, it does feel like there's a lot of exciting activity now. You know, with, with the ease of creating and releasing packages and and keeping them up to date, and the fact that people are learning from each other in terms of development practices, at I'm very excited about that part of the, the community, and I can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah, all right, sweet. Yeah, I was following up, uh, well, I actually just read about, you know, like one of the core maintainers of Emacs leaving. Stefan, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I saw a Reddit post saying that, you know, we need to get more people into, into the core, because if we don't, then the people who actually know how everything works is gonna leave, and then once they wanna make something, it's gonna be a, a they're going to be in real trouble to uh, basically it's going to be really difficult to change something without actually knowing yeah. how everything is you know put together <laughs> so, uh, i guess oddly enough like when it when when it comes to emacs and change i often find that 
a lot of the changes I make are actually to my own behavior. <laughs> you know, just learning how to use the things that are already there. And then the next level is learning how to configure or maybe even modify slightly the packages I use. I I haven't come across anything that I want to change core for, um, mainly because the first two layers are keeping me very, very occupied. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm sure someday, you know, I or other people will get into that. And it's it's amazing to see what's what's been possible so far with what we have. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I tried looking at you know some of the stuff from Core, and I gotta say it's you know you you can learn quite a bit of Elisp and uh, seeing all that good stuff if you if you pay attention. But yeah, it it will take you a good time to actually go through everything. Yeah. <laughs> all right, um, I think that's about everything. Um, do you have any uh, shout outs that you want to give or tips or links or anything of that sort? Um, uh, you, we've mentioned that kind of the, the sense of the Emacs community as being one of the things that's kept you going. And mm -hmm. so if people are listening to this and want to get more of that sense of what the Emacs community is like, I really like reading uh, planet.emacsen.org. So that's planet, P-L-A-N-E-T, dot E-M-A-C-S-E-N dot org um, as a way to very quickly discover all sorts of Emacs related blogs uh, in one place. And if you have an Emacs related blog and it's not on there yet, please contact the maintainers, um, the Edward O'Connor, for example, for the English one uh, to, to get yours added. So there's that. And I also like looking at uh, Reddit R Emacs. So R-E-D-D-I-T dot com slash R slash Emacs gets you lots of you know links and discussions sometimes about uh, thing, all sorts of things that are Emacs related. So that's really cool. And I'm looking forward to more podcast episodes from you too. Yeah, uh, yeah. I just need to, you know, get more. I have a couple of shows more lined up. I just need to set the time right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It is, you know. Things, yeah. So, yeah. It's, it's, it's great to hear from people and, and to get that sense that, hey, you know, th th there are people in this and they're actually really cool. And, uh, and you learn all sorts of things that you might not have expected to. Yeah. So, I'm all for more conversations. Yeah, I, I just want more people to, you know, do stuff, you know, to promote Emacs, you know, and that just, you know, show that people, there are actually people in Emacs that use Emacs and stuff like that. Because, I mean, you, you're doing it, so, um, and I think what you do is awesome. So I just said, you know what, let me try it. Let's see what happens. Go for it. So, yeah, thank, thank you for doing this. Yeah, yeah, well, thank you for doing the Hangouts. Uh, yeah, if it wasn't for the Hangouts, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll keep on doing more of them then. Okay. All right, so...